Um, all right, everybody. Well, thank you for sticking with us here to the end. And we have our closing remarks now. And we are going to um, hear a summary of the conference and also where CRQ is going next and where we are going forward. And I'm excited to bring up um, that context and our closing remarks speaker, uh, Cody Scott. He's a senior analyst for security and risk at Forrester. So give him a big round of applause. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Wow, I have so much power right now because it doesn't end until we close. It's kind of scary, right? All right, so let's get this. Um, I want to jump in, and I'm going to do a couple of maybe unconventional things with a presentation format that you'd likely see at a standard conference. Um, I like to kind of push the boundaries a little bit, so this will probably be unhinged. We're going to do this together. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. We'll see. All right, let's jump in. So. Ignore this quote for a second, because I have a different quote that I actually want to talk about. Um, when Nick opened the conference the other day, he said something that I thought actually sums up this conference very well. And it's actually something I've used in my own research reports that I've written about risk quantification. And it's that we're taking risk from an art to a science. I love that statement. I think it's so interesting, because what it really does is it implies a fundamental shift a radical change in the way that we're doing something with more precision, more certainty, more methodology. And so we see a fundamental shift in core principles and also in expectations that you would have for the entire industry. So it's a pretty big statement wrapped up in a pretty nice, uh, a nice point there. But the thing that I think is especially interesting, because I'm gonna give a lot of examples, but we're gonna relate it back to CRQ. Um, FAIR and CRQ are an exercise in making that which was seemingly impossible, possible. So as we keep that in mind, let's think about this, or as Nelson Mandela said, um, it's always impossible until it's done. As it turns out, humans are actually very good at doing this. So let's look at a couple of examples. And yes, this is Taylor Swift. So if you saw my presentation last year, it was about Taylor Swift. So I had to put Taylor Swift in here somehow for continuity purposes, I swear. Um, but it is related, so let me explain this. Last year on this stage, I proclaimed that Taylor Swift was our greatest unofficial champion for cybersecurity risk management in light of the Ticketmaster debacle that had happened earlier that year in 2023. Now, obviously that doesn't work here anymore. I'm not gonna repeat the same thing, but what is kind of fun is when we think about this theme of taking the impossible and making it possible, did the artist on the left performing at a small county fair imagine it was possible to be one of the most sold out global tours in the world? Probably not, maybe it was a dream, but it wasn't certainly possible at that point in time. Um, but it did become that, right? So this is a quick example here, uh, but it's always impossible until it's done. But let's shift to something that's not pop culture necessarily. So. At one point in human history, we realized that the Earth is, in fact, round. Um, flat Earthers do not say anything. So <laughs> you don't actually fall into an abyss. There's no abyss if you sail too far. Uh, but, and we know this because Pythagoras himself actually hypothesized that the Earth was a sphere. Aristotle provided the first experimental evidence uh, using lunar phases to actually prove that that could be true. And once we did that, despite the flat Earth conspiracy, uh, this seemingly impossible reality did, in fact, become possible. And what was the benefit of that? Not just to prove that it could be done, but, or to prove that it existed, but in fact, it had profound impacts on how we look at astronomy, geography, and navigation throughout human history. Another example, doing something very hard, mapping the human genome. A seemingly impossible task. Did you know that there are over three billion signatures that make up the human genome? And those have to be mapped manually to different letter sequences that are then put out uh, to come up with that final output. When the researchers started this project, I think it was back in 20, uh, 2002, uh, they were able to get to about 92% of the mapping very quickly. But then it took the rest of two decades to finish that last 8%. That was the piece that was seemingly impossible. The Human Genome Project was almost written off as a failure because of that last 8%. Why was it so difficult? Well, it was fundamentally a technology problem. We needed new labs, 
new computational tech to actually process the sequencing work that needed to be done, and you had to have people who were trained to look at this and actually know what to do. But there was an investment. Investment was put into it. We trained people, we developed the technology, and we were able to complete this back in 2022. As a result, again, not doing it just for the sake of doing it, there's a reason, there's benefit that we get. So despite those impossible hurdles, the work finished, and it's massively helping to unlock scientific and medical breakthroughs. Now, I have a third example. So I worked at NASA for 10 years, so I am going to absolutely talk about space. This frontier, which I think is especially important for our narrative, and well, let's just go ahead and call it the final frontier. So when I worked at NASA, I helped build their cyber risk management program. I brought FAIR into that mix, um, something that's still being developed and worked on today, despite me no longer being there. Um, but my former CIO at the time used to always say this quote when she would go to conferences, and I loved it. It always stuck with me. We're turning science fiction into fact. Now, that sounds a lot like what Nick said, and we didn't coordinate, uh, when he said taking risk from art to science. Same concept, right? That also got me thinking, risk quantification and the journey that the industry has been on to develop this discipline is actually very similar to the history of space exploration. So now we're gonna go into space because there's not enough examples here. Okay, so if we step back, there's three eras that you could really, uh, you can go much more deeper into this, but I wanted to keep it simple for everyone. Um, the pioneer years, think space race, think Sputnik, first human in space, um, the Apollo missions, the lunar landing in 1969, in this early era, the focus was on demonstrating feasibility, feasibility of launching something out of, uh, out of our gravity, gravity, landing something on a foreign object, in this case, the moon. And it was all about that concept of, is this feasible? How, what would it take to get it done? Actually, being, ended up being really expensive, but that's, you know, we had the political capital for it back then. Similarly, though, with CRQ, the question becomes, how can we viably model risk? This is the pioneer era, right? And Jack Jones actually solved that. It created the FAIR standard to answer that exact question. So that gives us a jump into the next era, the era of exploration, science-focused discovery. At this point, we landed, we successfully landed on Mars for the first time, the Viking 1 and 2 missions. The Voyager missions, which I have a soft spot in my heart for, um, provided humanity's first close-up images of outer planets and their moons, and it's still operating in interstellar, interstellar space today. And then, of course, we have the Hubble Space Telescope, which completely revolutionized our understanding of the universe, only to be surpassed recently by the, the James Webb Space Telescope. So just as the space program transitioned from feasibility to demonstration, demonstrating that it could be done, going out and actually doing something with it, CRQ did the same thing. Risk quantification did the same thing. The question became, we have the model, but can we actually, what can we actually accomplish with it? What can we actually gain by quantifying? I know it's worth it in some cases, but what are those cases that are the most value to us? So that's that era of discovery. And this brings us to today, the modern era. Human presence and sustainability. This is the key focus of where space, flow, space exploration is. Here you can think of the International Space Station, model for international cooperation and collaboration. It gave rise to more sustainable launch methods, more sustainable materials, new advances in technology, ultimately to support the goal of having continuous human presence in space. We also have the Artemis missions that will take humans not only back to the moon, but eventually to Mars. So in CRQ terms, we're well past just is there a model and can that model be used? At this point, it's how do we actually scale and adapt quantification to new challenges, new domains? And we are firmly here today, and this is the exciting part, I think, uh, the turning point for CRQ, because we're looking at it not just as a modeling exercise, we have new standards available to us like FAIRCAM, so emphasis on control analytics, materiality, third party, AI risk, 
the future is open from there. We can continue to find ways to adapt. But ultimately, what this shows us is that even in something like CRQ, where there are plenty of naysayers still to this day, the impossible has become, the impossible has become extremely possible. So where do we go next? So that was a quick summary of where we've been, but really, where we go next is the more interesting part. So Forrester Research, we do lots of surveys. We send out an uh, annual business, business risk survey to thousands of practitioners around the globe and decision makers. Uh, last year, when I was giving a talk about the state of CRQ, I had a stat on a slide that said about 21% of organizations around the globe uh, said that they planned to invest in CRQ. And that was exciting at the time. Still only 20%, so kind of a good news, bad news situation. But that was exciting. There was momentum. Well, this year, we updated our survey, asked new questions about the depth of CRQ, and what we actually saw is that there's unprecedented change. So 29% of organizations not only invested above and beyond that initial number, but they piloted CRQ and then fully implemented a platform. Now, this is focusing on technology, but why is that significant? It's significant because the momentum is there. The investment is there. The change within organizations is being recognized that there is additional value you can gain from injecting these methods into your program. The other benefit here, not on this slide, is that another 31% of organizations plan to actually complete a pilot in the next 12 months. And our data shows if you do a pilot, you're much more likely to have a successful implementation. But there are still barriers. We can't ignore them. These are the things that you live and feel every day if you're a practitioner. And I want to show you, share with you the top three that come up in our surveys. So top three challenges to CRQ adoption are alarmingly high, although the problems themselves are not significant or not relatively as complex as they should be. So 47% of organizations, almost half around the world, say that because their organization prioritizes compliance assessment over risk assessment, they can't move forward with CRQ. That implies that there's not much appetite to try new things. There are many ways to get around this. I even wrote a report about building the business case for CRQ that talks about this, but still a very lived experience for many practitioners. 46% around the world say that they lack internal CRQ expertise. I think we all hear that all the time. We know that there's a barrier to entry, so to speak, when it comes to adopting CRQ, but the fact that it's 46%, that's still massively substantial uh, for, again, the lived experience of the day-to-day -day practitioner and their view on whether or not this is sustainable. The third piece here is that 35% of organizations feel that they lack sufficient internal risk data. I am wondering when this problem is gonna go away because you absolutely have more data than you think and you need less of it than you think. But again, this is not the case for how people perceive the challenges of CRQ. So that's the bad news. But the good news is that these are all very solvable problems. So let's, we'll, and we'll touch on some ways to overcome these in a moment, but I want to then talk about the more exciting change that's happening. So while the barriers still exist, the challenges tend to stay the same, but priorities are starting to change. And this is the cool part, because this is how you start to see that things are gaining momentum and that people are finding new ways to discover and explore. Ultimately, there's a shift from a strategic perspective where I think risk quant has sat for many years to getting into more practical use cases in cybersecurity, more tactically focused. So the number one priority, and this one is a little evergreen, but it keeps coming up in new ways in terms of how folks think uh, how feasible it actually is for them. Almost 40% of organizations want to enhance their current risk practices. They don't want to make substantial changes, but they see the value. And the fact that this number is at 37% means that they understand the path for how to make this real for themselves. Number two priority for organizations, they want to enable better prioritization. I think we talk about that a lot. We talk about being able to prioritize better, and it's nice, but it's fluffy. It doesn't really mean anything. It means something when we actually put probability numbers in front of us, when we put exposure, quantified exposure numbers in front of us, and then when we start to use that within a decision workflow that is being done in the organization. This has jumped up to a high number because folks are figuring out that they can do that. There are resources available to make that easier for them. 
And the last point here, 34%, so about a third of organizations, uh, and this is where I think is really exciting, they want to bring CRQ into the SOC. They want to make it more security operations focused. This could reimagine the traditional role of the security analyst if this were the case. It's a big hill to climb, but the fact that this is the number three priority around the globe shows that the need is there and it's critical. So I want to close out on a couple of things here. I want to talk about, in keeping with our theme, making the impossible possible, how do we take risk quantification from fiction to fact? I have five strategies for you, and this comes from a report that we published earlier this year that actually many of you participated in. You contributed some wonderful thought leadership to that, that report. Um, it's called Building the Business Case for Cyber Risk Quantification, um, available online. I also have a blog. Come talk to me. I'll send it to you. Uh, but how do we tackle the impossible? How do we actually turn this from fact to fiction, from art to science? The very first thing, begin using concrete risk terminology. And I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. All of these should be highly intuitive. You should be nodding aggressively and saying, yes, Cody, that makes sense. Because we know that these strategies are intuitive, and we know that they work. So the first part here, common terminology. FAIR already does this for you. Easy. Check the box. Done. Don't check the box. But keep it there. Uh, the problem, though, is that inconsistent terminology will often lead to situations where everything is being equally considered the same level of risk, and that's what we're trying to entirely avoid. We know that that's not true. Terminology helps us get specific about that. Second strategy, start with the right framework. Again, we're at FAIRCON. We're, this is with the FAIR Institute. FAIR is a framework. We can leverage that in this case. But the problem here is that fundamentally, risk is a time-based scenario. It deals with uncertainty and estimates. So if someone is telling you that their CRQ approach is really just a score on a, a report card or a number or something like that, um, it's completely snake oil in this case because it's not fundamentally the right model for measuring risk. The third component, make executive buy-in a critical success factor. Someone else was just talking about this on the stage. Um, this goes more into the programmatic considerations of how you make FAIR sustainable. That's actually something that I, I tend to see kind of lacking in the conversations at FAIRCON, which is more about that process piece. But this is an important factor. Make it a critical success factor for your organization. Find that risk champion and build the momentum early, even if it's just for initial concepts. The fourth strategy here, plan your data strategy. So if one of the biggest barriers is that we feel like we don't have enough internal risk data, the good news is very solvable. Um, the planning the data strategy component really means as you go through and start doing the exercises, document. Document what you do and don't have. When I was at NASA, we actually did this. We sat down and said, here's our tech stack. Here are the inputs and outputs we get. Uh, in order to do certain analyses in given scenarios that are the most important to us, we need to also then collect information from the legal office, from HR, from other areas of the business. Um, that made it very clear to us what we needed so that that big scary problem of how do we actually start quantifying something became much less scary, became much more manageable. And then the final strategy here, pilot a CRQ project. So I said earlier that there's a strong correlation between piloting CRQ and actually seeing it succeed and become more sustainable. And that's absolutely true, because when you do a pilot, you're picking something that is meaningful, but you're not boiling the ocean. It's not too big. It's something that can be very small within your team. Ultimately, it helps make a decision. So start small. Now, I wanted to keep this short, so I'm going to go ahead and close it out here, because I know it's the end of the day. But I want to leave you all with one last thing. So. At NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, because again, I gotta keep the space theme going, so Jet Propulsion Lab in California, they have this motto, dare mighty things, and that always stuck with me. I actually have multiple pictures of it on my phone, uh, nerdy stuff, it's fine. But I encourage and challenge all of you to keep daring, keep pushing the limits, keep changing the conventions within your organization, and change how you manage cyber risk for the better. Thank you all.
Well, thank you, Cody. I think you ended that on a perfect note. Um, as we come to the end of Faircon, I, I hope that we all walk away with a renewed sense of energy and, and what's possible and, and what we can all do together. Uh, to just close it out and give us some last final thoughts, I'm going to invite Nick Santa and Jack Jones up to just, um, uh, yeah, close out the conference, uh, say some thank yous, and send us all off. So give them a round of applause. Jack, where are you? Okay, here you come. Hall of Famer, first one, you know? So, uh, so, uh, yeah. so this is a moment where, this is completely unscripted. We were asked like uh, half an hour ago if we wanted to uh, come up with uh, final remarks. And every year we, uh, we just share our impromptu comments, you know, and some takeaways and some reflection points. And so, Jack, what, what do you make of the conference in terms of um, how we are progressing or not the profession, yeah. Well, you know, every year I, I express, you know, gratitude and amazement at, at how far we continue to come and how, how quickly, and this year's no difference. I see so much progress. You know, there's still a lot to do, obviously, but um, when I see the energy um, and the quality of the conversations and presentations that occur here, you know, I'm just so optimistic and, and grateful. And uh, as, I, as I said last night, it's, um, it, it's a privilege to be a part of this, um, be on this journey with you. And I can't thank you enough for all of the work you do and, and the challenges that you face and that uh, we can overcome. So thank you. Thank you. No, for me. I have a lot of thoughts in my head, in my head and so I'm trying to keep it uh, um, crisp. First, a reflection, you know, Jack, I uh, remember when he uh, figured out what risk was and started documenting it and applying it. And uh, sometimes he used to say, it's like, I hope I'm going to see the world change and realize that this is the way to go. This is the truth based on first principles before I die. It would be nice. I don't know it's going to happen. And many inventors and many even going to say uh, artists often don't experience the success and the fruit of their work, you know, until the next generation. And so very glad that not only we can give you an award, and he told me, is this it for me? So no, 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 it's keep it up, uh, Jack, you know, but also seeing that he's surrounded with a bunch of uh, helpers and people that can help stretch fair principles in, in many ways and advance the profession. I think we've seen the proof of this this year. So. Uh, there's many people that are contributing to uh, advancing the profession. And I think this year we made the bet to elevating the discourse and try to make um, uh, this uh, relevant, not just for how we quantify risk, but what for. And how do we build programs and make it relevant for the enterprise? And so I've seen a lot of CISOs also coming with their teams and having this discussion. So one, focusing on the objective, you know, what are the outcomes we need to achieve? And then looking to their, you know, their colleagues and saying, do you think you can make it? What do you need to make it happen? And vice versa, validating one another. So these things are happening. We're going to do more of that. So Todd, in, in his uh, opening remarks, uh, uh, told us that he will um, we'll, we'll focus on that. And so I'm very hopeful that this really becomes a modern you know, risk management profession that is more of a science than an art. And um, last, I want to leave you with a challenge. You know, This year's theme was you know, to manage cyber risk from a uh, at the pace of the business, at the speed of the business. And so uh, this is a challenge for all of us, you know, and uh, for all of you to go back and try to look at your role in your enterprise uh, to be those people can be the allies to the business, the indispensable partners with the business, because you're allowing them to unlock possibilities and make decisions that they couldn't do as well without you. And that goes with the idea of pilot. Sometimes you need to start small, being valuable in one decision and provide clarity in one situation where there was doubt, it was a black hole, it was uncertainty, a lot of stress, and you brought clarity in there, you brought rationale. And uh, with the, it removed a lot of stress and allowed us to achieve outcomes and build from there. So we'd love next year to collect a lot of stories of how you have been uh, becoming good partners and allies to the business and turn uh, the department of no to the department of uh, no, you know, K-N-O-E-W. So with that, 
have safe travels, and thank you for being part of this. Thank you.